A, B, C. Always be casting. A mantra you may have heard many a player repeat over your time in the game. Whether or not you realized it, this is one of the most important pieces of information you could ever be given. And so we come to this guide. Welcome to ABC, a beginner's guide to healers. Don't let that length scare you. If you've seen any of my other content, you know I take a thorough approach, attempting to explain in ways a newbie will understand. So I will be covering a wide array of topics that will get you into the healer role and performing better than you ever thought possible for yourself. I'll be covering topics a beginner should deal with, while also going in-depth later into more intermediate and advanced topics that you would benefit from thinking ahead about. Just because you're a beginner, doesn't mean you can't make use of these topics either. And if you want to learn beyond just a surface level, the more information you would benefit from. Take learning slow, though. Learn a concept at a time, instead of all at once. It might all be info you want to know by the time you hit level cap, but you don't need to learn it all right now, immediately. Level 1, you are a pro. Everyone starts somewhere. You may already know some info due to osmosis, or you may have none. Either way, take it slow and steady. And with Endwalker only two months away as of the release of this video, and the Sage Drop releasing, many new people may be jumping into healing along with all the normal newbies. And I highly recommend... Don't start your healing journey with Sage. Practice first. Also, when you queue for dungeons as a newbie, nobody knows your experience level. If you're not confident in yourself, tell your group, Hey, I'm a newbie. Advice is appreciated. There's an unfortunate fear in people that causes them to typically not give advice unless asked for it first. So I recommend asking for advice, even if you think you're doing well. You never know what things you could be doing better. Make heavy use of the chapter select for traversing through subtopics you already understand and such, but you never know if you might learn something new. Let's get started in the wide world of healing. Before we get into any specific topics, let's dispel some rumors and misconceptions. First off, and most importantly, healers do not have more responsibility than DPS or tanks. They have different responsibilities. The Trinity system is called as such not just because there are three roles, but because the three roles synergize with each other. All three roles also have many shared responsibilities, such as learning boss patterns or dealing with mechanics. All roles can be performing at bare minimum or high contribution levels. All roles affect how much effort the other roles need to put in. Good DPS and tanks lower how much healing a healer must do. Mistakes from those people need to be cleaned up by the healer, but are not the responsibility of the healer if things go wrong. Someone screwing up a mechanic and dying is not on the healer. Alt Roy blowing up a samurai isn't your fault, it's theirs. No matter how much they scream about, WHERE ARE THE HEALS?! As a healer, you're not the leader or the arbiter of who lives and dies. You're an equal member of the team. You alone can be responsible for the success of an entire run, but just because someone is being an idiot doesn't mean you are allowed to just stop healing them. Further, people argue that, say, DPS are of little to no importance because you can clear without them? Well then healers are also of little to no importance because I clear without a living healer all the time. I finish the boss as a DPS tank because the tank and healer are eating the floor or such. You're not some higher level of importance or a god. Healers adjust is not a thing. Adjust your corpse into being a good player instead of yelling at healers to adjust. People will use it as a joke all the time, but people who genuinely think this way... Well, the corpse speaks for itself. They'll end up killing themselves at some point. Just remember they're an idiot and trudge on. And of course, learn your healer's toolkit. The healers all have differences and their own respective toolkits. 
If you need to learn how to use a specific Healy's Toolkit, there are plenty of videos out there about each, including my own. That seems like a good baseline to get into more specifics. So let's get into it. This seems like a weird place to start, huh? But it will quickly make sense. There's been a lot of debate over the years about this topic. People call it many different things, green DPS, dead enemies can't hurt you, or my personal mantra, holy is a heal. But it isn't exclusive to white mage and holy, it's something all the healers can do, and should be doing. You can say whatever you want about what the role of a healer is, all that stuff, but fact of the matter is, if you want to be a good healer, you will learn to add in DPS. The better the healer you are, the less you will need to actually be healing. And without using DPS, you will spend most of your time standing still doing nothing. That's just how healing works in this game. It's not about pushing out as much healing as you can, constantly. Your party will survive with far, far less healing, and will survive better with your added DPS. You do significantly speed up duty clears, but it's not all about speed like detractors make it out to be. You increase the safety of a run. If you only skip one mechanic in a fight with your DPS added in, you could be skipping the most dangerous part of a fight. Some things are only safe or even outright possible if the healer is helping DPS. Then there's the matter of learning to fit in DPS. Unless you're getting a tank who is doing giant pools as early as Sestasha, you don't need to heal 95% of the time. The footage you have been watching for this section has been a run of Sestasha with me healing as little as possible, because that's basically how I heal every dungeon. You can see the full run in the description if you want, but just, just look how little I have to heal and then apply that to yourself. It is extremely safe to learn how to DPS as a healer in the earlier dungeons. Then you can slowly follow the difficulty curve as you level up. Start practicing when it is safe to DPS and when it is not. Measure how much a single heal will help the tank, then start playing Limbo. Don't start healing the tank until they have below 60% health or 50% or 40%. Find what is safe for each run. Tanks who have better gear and higher skill levels can afford you to go lower, while less geared and less experienced tanks need more healing. Either way, you don't need to be putting out all the DPS all the time immediately. Add in a little more at a time, and eventually it will become second nature for you. And of course, don't overdo your learning. You do need to remember to heal at some point. Some players end up entirely forgetting to heal. Becoming a green DPS is all well and good and to be encouraged, but you're still a green DPS. That green part is important. If you start letting people geared or obviously skilled players die a lot, you need to start tuning your DPS back a little. There is a balance to be struck, but it's not the hardest balance to find. But of course, some of you may not be convinced. Maybe you've heard the arguments against healer DPS and believe them. So let's entirely debunk those myths. If you already understand that you should attempt to DPS as a healer, skip ahead to the next major section. Otherwise, strap in because I reject your reality and substitute my own. The first argument is that healer DPS is too weak to matter. I mean, if you're bad it is. But if we're being objective, healers put out plenty of damage. There's a lot of variables that can change how much a healer is contributing, from gear to skill level of the team, or a lot else. So let's keep things consistent. Generally, there's an idea of tanks do 60% of a DPS's damage, and healers do 40%. But it's probably closer to 55% and 45%, but 60 and 40 are rounded numbers. So let's take some numbers and remember 
DPS stands for damage per second. A DPS doing 100% of a DPS's damage is 1,000 DPS. A tank doing 60% of a DPS's damage is 600 DPS, and a healer doing 40% of a DPS's damage is 400 DPS. Effectively, every dungeon has three DPS players total, since the tank and healer together add up to a third DPS. So let's assume an 18 minute dungeon run, but the healer was doing no DPS. That's a total of 2600 DPS, and 18 minutes is 1080 seconds. 1080 times 2600 DPS equals 2,808,000 damage required to clear the dungeon. Now let's add in healer DPS for 3000 DPS, and while we're at it, let's also do a test of 2000 DPS where you're missing an entire DPS. 2.8 million divided by 3000 DPS equals 936 seconds or 15 minutes 36 seconds. 2.8 mil divided by 2000 DPS is 1404 seconds or 23 minutes and 24 seconds. The healer DPS improved the clear time by two and a half minutes almost, and having two DPS instead of just one improves dungeon times by over five minutes. Here's the thing though, that second one, that wasn't actually a test of having a DPS missing. That was an average dungeon test. 1000 DPS, let's just say, isn't optimal play, but it's still good and potentially above average. 1000 was just a baseline. What your average DPS player might be doing, and not some super ultimate triple legend by the way. So let's say, between the tank and the DPS, you're missing 600 DPS total. DPS 1 is only doing 800 DPS, DPS 2 only 750, and the tank 450 DPS. And the healer is doing 0 DPS. So let's do one more test. These numbers, but the healer is now doing 400 DPS. 2.8 mil divided by 2400 is 1170 seconds, or 1930, an almost 4 minute faster run. If you want to talk about how ineffective healer DPS is, you have to actively fight against math like this. In reality, healer DPS is significant, and because healers have much simpler DPS toolkits compared to a DPS or a tank, it's easier to get the full damage output. It's never as simple as the numbers show. There's so many variables, like I said, how much healing you have to fit in, which will lower how much DPS you do. But if we keep everything but DPS output consistent, the time saves prove the effectiveness. But I also said it's not about the overall time saves even if the time saves do add up to be literal hours of time over your gameplay. No, it's about the minute time saves, the little seconds that you save. People act like DPS doesn't help your healing, but it does. You actively need less healing if you do DPS, which means you can do DPS more, which means you kill enemies faster, which means less healing, which means more DPS, which means it's a positive feedback loop, but actually exists. Shortening a fight by, say, 10 seconds is four less skills you need to use, and 10 seconds the tank needs to survive for less. However much health that 10 seconds is worth is 10 seconds of healing that is no longer needed. Be it one heal or three heals, a few seconds isn't nothing. Resources are limited. A tank only has so many defensive cooldowns. You only have so many healing ones. And when they run out, it may be impossible to survive the pool any longer than you have. It might become an inevitable race against time before you all die because the enemies weren't killed fast enough. But a dead enemy can't hurt you. 
Holy is a heal, and you make something like big pulling safer or even outright possible to do. Let's get into actually healing now that we've established that you should fit in DPS. From this point forward, I won't really be mentioning doing DPS much. It will happen here and there, but for the most part, I'll be focusing on the main part of healer, which obviously is healing and how to heal better. When playing as a healer, gameplay tends to be very simple. Target a player, cast a heal, HP goes up. This can be with keybinds, clicking with the mouse, or using the D-pad up and down arrows for controller. But if that was all there was to it, we wouldn't be here. The real lesson to learn is the community phrase, the only health point that matters is the last one. That is to say, if the tank has one HP, they're still alive. If they never hit zero, you did your job. This applies to the entire party even. If they're not dead, you successfully healed. Now, this is a bit of a hyperbole or only applicable to emergencies or high-end content. You generally should never let your tank get that low, unless they're using an ultimate cooldown, which will always set them to one anyway. I'm sure most experienced healers will tell you that they play Limbo with their party's health, but they all know when to stop playing Limbo. If they ever do let their tanks drop that low, well, they've probably seen worse. The opposite end of the spectrum is healing when anyone has even a speck of missing HP. Making sure everyone is at max HP is known as topping off. You're topping off the bars. And this is typically not something you should be trying to do unless you're healing a significant amount of HP with that top off. Or you're doing harder levels of content. Everyone has a built-in regen. It's very small, something like 1% HP per tick, but consider your DPS players. They might not be taking any unavoidable damage for a while. If they're sitting at 90% HP and no damage is coming out for a while, they'll just naturally hit max HP before the next attack that will damage them. Then there is the actual regens healers have. Instead of trying to rush a player back to full health, use some kind of skill with regens. If everyone drops to half health, you can use an AoE regen, if you have one, not all the healers do, and let that handle the rest. It's almost never a race to heal back up to full health, unless things are already going wrong. Let me say again, there is time. Tanks are the ones you might be tempted to constantly keep topped off meanwhile. They're taking constant damage from enemies and will need healing every little bit. Again, unless you're doing harder content or the tank is really underperforming for whatever reason, you don't need to be keeping them at full health. Tank HP bars are a lot beefier than you or the DPS's HP. So while 90% means the tank is theoretically missing a lot more HP, you're probably still not going to need to heal them yet. It might take five, six auto attacks from a boss before any sort of healing is needed. In your average content, there is nothing that will require you to constantly keep your party at max HP at all times. Tank Busters, attacks meant to do major damage to a tank, will typically only take out half of a tank's HP bar in the hardest hitting dungeons, and that's without them using a cooldown. Trials and Raids later on will push this damage higher, but by that point you've had time to learn and already know how to deal with it. Raid-wide damage, meanwhile, will typically do half the HP of all non-tanks and significantly less to the tank because, well, they're a tank. Now, obviously, every dungeon is different and all that. Sometimes the numbers do go higher or lower, but the numbers never become 90% in a single hit in a dungeon. Again, that's saved for more intermediate content at a minimum. At the earliest, the story mode raids. If you're ever unsure of how much one of your heals is going to heal a tank, at the start of a dungeon, look at their HP total and throw a single heal on them. 
If Cure 1, say, heals 500 HP, and the tank has 1500 HP, you heal one third of the tank's health in a single basic heal. So you don't need to consider healing the tank until they're at least around 70% health or lower. And then your DPS allies, or even yourself, 500 HP is worth a lot more percentage-wise. So, it is a limbo, but not as dangerous as it sounds from the name. How low can you go? But how low are you comfy going? That's how low you can go. The more experienced healers really can play like the last HP is the only one that matters no matter what, but as a newbie you should be more flexible, especially because not every group is the same. Some tanks might not have more HP because they're using bad or weak gear. I've had a lot of tanks have less HP as me as a healer. They might not use cooldowns correctly either. Tank cooldowns drastically change how much healing you have to do. You might end up panicking, which is also to say, don't panic. If they aren't going crazy with their pool sizes, or making mistakes to rack up vulnerability stacks, which a vulnerability stack increases how much damage someone takes, you are still in full control of the situation. And even if the tank does take a tumble, it's not instantly going to lead to a wipe. You have to adjust your healing based on the group, for better or for worse. But generally, you can always follow your own limbo rules. And if you ever overestimate the ability of a tank, or the power of your heals, well, the last point is the only one that matters. Afterwards, adjust your healing and keep pushing forward. Communication will also be a huge boon in situations like that. But of course, not everything goes as planned. The tank may end up going below that 1 HP mark and die, and the enemies will then turn on the group and eat you all, giving you a game over. The game will then delete itself and wipe your hard drive, but not before calling Homeland Security to come detain you. Wait a minute, that's not what happens. When your tank dies, you just keep fighting. Keep you and your allies alive and try to raise the tank as soon as you can. Ideally, without letting anyone else die. That's really it. Some people act like it's the end of the world, quite literally, if even one person dies. Yes, it's a mistake. Pick yourself and them back up and get back to healing. Things aren't over yet. Firstly, let's just mention Swift Cast. It's a free raise every 60 seconds. Well, it still costs mana, but no cast time. The ability to instantly solve the problem is right there. Tanks back up. But as you get better as a player, you might start using Swift Cast for more things, or accidentally use it so you don't have it for raising. At most, things have become a bit harder now. You and your DPS friends aren't made to take a lot of damage. Depending on the situation, Spam Cure might actually become the ideal strat. Sure, you're going to overheal a little, but if you try and play Limbo at even 90% HP and the next attack is going to be a tank buster, you or the DPS will die before you get off another heal. If it's just auto attacks, it's not too major an issue. But that's the extreme end as well. The other extreme end, because everything is a spectrum and not just two possible futures, is there's one very weak enemy alive that will gently pat you on the head over and over while you have time to slow cast a raise to bring the tank back up. This goes back to not panicking and keeping control on the situation. It will be harder than having a living tank, but completely doable. Things aren't all going to instantly kill you. It's not always the tank either. It can be a DPS, or even you. If it's you, hope your party has a DPS that can raise, or it is an 8-man party and you have a co-healer to raise you. In this case, here's something extremely important to know. Raises make you immune to most damage. Typically, unless you're getting into raid content or harder, everything the boss does is 
unable to damage you for a few seconds after you raise. Use this info to your advantage. If you have 5 seconds of immunity, and the boss is going to do a raid-wide attack that hits you in 3 seconds, let the boss attack first. Then heal yourself, and get back to healing your group. Use those 3 seconds to take stock of the situation, and use the attack as your green light. Also be sure to inform anyone else who doesn't use this invincibility about said invincibility. But also, try and wait until after you see the attack finish before reviving. Use the animation time of the revival to carry you past the raid-wide attack. On the off chance the attack does go through resurrection immunity. When it comes to a DPS dying, you should make it a point to raise them as soon as you can too, but it's not as imperative you get them up as fast as a tank or a co-healer. But a dead ally is a dead ally. If there is any threat to the tank dying, make sure they are kept alive first. Raising the DPS is not worth it if the tank is going to die too. Of course, this would only be in difficult pools or bosses, or when the tank grabbed a lot of enemies at once. Typically, you have time to raise a dead DPS too. Top off the tank, throw a regen or a shield on them, then start raising. This is where topping off is important in normal content. Raising without swift cast takes a long, long time, to the point that most healers entirely avoid it at all costs. If they aren't the type to always hold swift cast for raising, they'll wait until it next comes off of cooldown to even begin to raise. The only other option is to slow cast, which means you can't heal the group until the cast finishes. As a result, top off everyone, regens, shields, and then get raising. If the group is going to survive through the long 7 second cast, it'll be because you prepared, or there was no danger to begin with. Then there's what happens when you have multiple dead people. This is where an order of operations absolutely needs to start being enacted. Things can get really bad in harder content, but when all else fails, you have a near foolproof method for maximizing your survivability. First, save yourself. You can't heal if you are dead. If your co-healer is alive, they should be focusing on saving themselves too. Second, save the tank. Third, save the DPS, if at all possible. May not be possible without first raising them. Fourth, raise the healer. Fifth, raise the tank. However, these two can swap based on the specific situations. If you have one tank alive, you'll want to raise the healer first. But, if both tanks are dead, you'll want to raise a tank, so that it's not constantly punching you over and over. And then finally, start raising the DPS. And then even within the DPS, there is a res priority. Summoners and Red Mages are DPS who can raise too. Red Mage especially is strong at raising allies. Then there's also player skill to take into account. That dead dragoon is called the Legend and has a shiny weapon. Maybe the memes are stupid and I should raise this guy who spent a minute tanking the boss because the tanks both died. I'm definitely not venting here. Totally hypothetical. <coughs> the point is, make sure everyone alive is safe and sound before starting to raise. Follow the flow chart, and if things are so bad, Sacrifice the life of someone else to save yourself. If all the raises are dead, it's a race against time of if the remaining players can finish the boss without you. This can be very doable, especially if you have a paladin who knows the proper and correct use of clemency. But longer and more difficult fights won't have that same level of leeway. Further, notice I said nothing about whose fault it was. Whenever someone dies, Typically, you're gonna blame yourself, aren't you? Well stop, not all mistakes are on you. You can fail to heal when it was needed, and that is on you. You can fail to heal when someone makes a mistake, and that's on them. You should still learn to prepare for when those mistakes happen, and heal them in time, 
but you can't heal stupid, as the saying goes. Everyone is human, except me, and so mistakes will happen. Stay calm, heal, and if they die, well, figure out what went wrong and plan for next time. Not everything is your fault. Not every death is because of you. Clean up the mistakes of others, but don't take responsibility for the mess they created. Like I said before, just because they scream, WHERE ARE THE HEALS?, doesn't mean that any heals were missing. Healers have a basic heal and a stronger version of this basic heal. Cure 1 and Cure 2, Physic and Adlocrium, etc. I will always be calling these Cure 1 and Cure 2 from this point forward, but just realize I'm not only talking about White Mage. The problem is people tend to rely on this earlier spell far too much, the Cure 1 spam healer. They maybe see that Cure 1 is more efficient mana-wise, but in almost every other way, it's inefficient. You may have heard the idea that Cure 2 replaces Cure 1 and you should remove it from your bar. This is basically true, but also not. Cure 1 does remain useful for level syncing and more intermediate and advanced play, so keep it on your bar, but avoid using it where possible. When you have to cast a spell for a heal, make it Cure 2. Generally, you should always be using your advanced toolkit. But why? Simply put, bigger heals are better. Why use two heals when you can use just one? Then that second spell can be a DPS spell instead. If you're never running into mana issues, you're actively wasting a resource. Mana is meant to be spent. Not wasted, mind you, but it's still a resource for you to use. Lucid Dreaming is going to cover most mana issues you will ever have, until getting into intermediate or advanced content. I have to keep saying that over and over, because this is a beginner guide. Keep that in mind. And I imagine the mana cost is the only reason most newbies tend to fall into the trap of Cure 1 spam. Maybe in the low levels, where you have very few healing options, you will have mana issues at points. Stone Vigil is the dungeon I will point at. If you regularly get through Stone Vigil with no mana issues at all, mana super high the whole run, never using Lucid Dreaming, you're actively wasting mana. Your goal of saving mana had the opposite effect. Lucid Dreaming is 3,500 mana every 60 seconds. Mana you could be using to do Cure 2 instead. With your mana worries gone, you'll start using Cure 2 and healing less. And DPSing more, which means less healing required. That feedback loop is back. I call it the opportunity cost, because you have the opportunity to use better skills. Time you are spending spamming Cure 1 is time you can't make proper use of all the stronger things you will get. The Cure 1 versus Cure 2 is a matter of GCD cost, GCD being global cooldown. Any spell. Dictionary of terms linked in the card in the top right appearing now. And this issue compounds once you start getting healing abilities. Why use Cure 1 or Cure 2 when you can use, say, on White Mage, Tetragrammaton? If you're spamming Cure 1, you don't evolve to use Cure 2, which means you never evolve to use your even stronger abilities. And this isn't just about Cure 1 and Cure 2 either. Every healer, you overall outgrow parts of their kit. The older skills never completely become worthless, but they become a lot more situational. Refusal to use any of these much stronger, much more efficient options shows an unwillingness to evolve or improve. That segues nicely into the next topic. Let me emphasize again, you should eventually start to outgrow parts of your toolkit, but never entirely get rid of them. Cure 2 replaces Cure 1 almost completely, but not completely. They become situational into higher end content, but still useful. 
you otherwise should be using every button in your toolkit. Unless it's something like Fluid Aura, your buttons all should be getting a workout. This is closely tied to the next topic too, so be sure to listen close to that one as well. But you really should be using every button. As pointed out, you're evolving into having stronger stuff. Eventually, even in the easiest content, you're not going to be able to survive on just cure spam alone. Even in dungeons, it just becomes physically unviable. I'm pretty sure even if you only used Kier 1 and used Lucid Dreaming, you would run out of mana before some boss fights end. But again though, it's not all boss fights, some easier than others, yada yada, but if you're ever feeling like you're doing a lot of work in healing, either people are standing in avoidable damage, or you're ignoring part of your toolkit. Or I guess that gear sucks as well, that's an option. It all exists to make your job easier, and harder healing even possible to begin with. Like, how can you ignore a button you could use every 30 seconds that gives a target a shield with 500 potency? That's a free cure 1 and some change that you can weave and can overheal because shields count as separate HP. And yes, use every button even include scary buttons like rescue. Maybe don't start using it until you are more experienced and confident. Maybe that's more for an intermediate guide. But rescue is meant to be used, as the name says, to rescue people from danger. Naturally, you're gonna get people who complain if you don't use it right. And you can be outright banned if you use it incorrectly on purpose. But when you know how a mechanic works, and another player doesn't, you can potentially save their life with forcing them into position. Granted, they will probably still get angry because that's how bad plays work. The number of black mages who whine about me about their ley lines when I rescued them is already into the millions. Okay, not quite, but, you know, being dead is apparently preferable to most black mage players. So much for the meme being Dragoon. Black mage is actively attempting to commit suicide. Which, if nothing else, take that as advice of who most often will need to be rescued out of death. Second most often will be ranged players standing right next to your healer bubble, but not inside of it. And then they will just walk out of it again, making you stupid sad over here. Further on the using every button thing, there is no such thing as an emergency button. You should plan out uses for everything where you can. Your spells, even when heals are less effective versus HP totals, are strong enough to recover from most if not all emergencies. Even up into the highest ends of content, every button gets used for normal healing. The only button, if any, that should be an emergency button is as we went over, Swift Cast. This is so you can instant raise if anyone dies, but every other button should be used as normal. Keep in mind though, I recommend Swift Cast as an emergency button for beginners only because you might make more mistakes than a more experienced player. Once you're more experienced, you'll outgrow Swift Cast as an emergency button too. The main reason we avoid this is like I mentioned earlier, if you're not learning to use all your buttons, you're not evolving as a healer. If this first new button is for emergencies, well, the next button is too. Then so is this one, and this one, and then your entire toolkit is emergency buttons. That sounds nice in theory, you're prepared for anything, but also why let that anything happen to begin with? Your heal should be used to prevent the emergencies entirely. You're a lot more likely to see emergencies happen if you're ignoring these powerful heals that can instantly heal your party. Or in the case of ones with regen, slowly but assuredly heal your party. If you're relying on only one or two buttons, you're going to take longer or have a harder time healing the group. By the time you can heal them up, your many buttons could have healed them up to 10 seconds ago. You have plenty of buttons by max level, a lot of them. Even if you do use a couple of them, you're almost guaranteed to have a few more of them around. 
you would have to actively just dump everything at once to run out of buttons to use. And then the cooldowns on most of them are pretty short, meaning they come back before you know it. That's the ultimate issue here. Even if you're throwing everything but the kitchen lala fell, you're still going to have buttons to use. And when you get to that really high end healing, you're just outright planning out when and where you use specific abilities. Button A completely solves the healing you need for this mechanic. Button B for this other mechanic afterwards. Not because you're saving them, but because they're most of all you need. Granted, there is a little bit of exaggeration here, since usually you'll also throw in a GCD heal and have a second healer also using abilities. But point remains, holding onto your buttons is just not earning you any favors. It's actively earning you a deficit. And finally, maybe I have a different definition for emergency, but your buttons aren't going to save an emergency anyway. Emergencies are where people start dying, which is why Swift Cast is the only real emergency button. It helps you instantly heal someone with a Swift Cast cure if you truly are out of other heals and they will die in the next three seconds. Or instantly raise someone after they die. When I think emergency in dungeons, it's everyone took an avoidable bit of damage right as unavoidable damage goes off. There's no time for me to react and save them, and they will either barely survive with like 100 HP and a vulnerability stack, or be dead. When I think of emergencies in 8-man parties, I think three or more people died, especially if one is my co-healer. Sure, the buttons can help the emergency, but you're not going to just save the emergency instantly. At the best of times, you can at least have prevented the death in the first place. But part of healing is dealing with deaths as they happen. Having a mental plan when one happens is all well and good, but if that plan is save this button forever and ever and never use it otherwise, then you're only hurting yourself and your party in the long run. Springboarding off the idea of what is or is not an emergency, when talking about dungeons, trash mobs are the part you want to be putting most of your effort into. Often, even single groups of enemies can be doing more damage to a tank than a boss will do outside of tank busters. Which if you forgot, tank busters are those attacks that specifically are meant to do a lot of damage to a tank. When trash are doing more damage except for the one attack meant to do a lot of damage, you can already see why trash is more dangerous, I hope. Specific types of enemies are obviously extra dangerous too, doing large AoEs in unison or at an awkward interval, where bosses are typically choreographed dances even with random AoE element. But most tanks don't just grab one pack of enemies, because there's really no reason to. No, they pull two, three, or even wall-to-wall -wall pull. That is to say, when a tank is wall-to-wall -wall pulling, they are running from one wall to the next. Dungeons are separated into sections, typically requiring you to kill groups of enemies before the path forward is opened. These are the walls in wall-to-wall -wall pull. Once you hit level 50 content and beyond, wall-to-wall -wall pulling becomes very common. This is where you'll get challenged the most in dungeon content, and where you'll be needing to use the more powerful tools I've been harping on all video. If three enemies can be doing more damage to a tank than a boss, ten plus enemies will most certainly be hitting the tank like they're a paper bag. This is where proper cooldown usage from both you and the tank comes in, reducing damage where you can with defensive buffs or doing DPS to shorten the length of the fight. But also, this is where doing DPS is hardest. You have to watch your tank's HP at all times because of bursts of damage or running out of cooldowns to bolster their own defense, etc. This is the hardest part to learn as an average healer, and is the part of healing that most relies on having a good group of party members. 
consider everything we've already talked about. For you to do DPS, you need to not be spamming heals, which means the tank will need to be doing defensive cooldowns. To be able to finish the fight without deaths, your DPS need to put out enough damage to not have you and the tank run out of resources. Without these things from your party, it's often difficult to tell if a wipe is your fault. Pools where I did balanced DPS and healing with pools where I ended up only spamming heals were indistinguishable by the time of the tank dying, or outright a wipe. But in all scenarios, proving how much more dangerous trash ends up being than a boss, and then becomes way more dangerous once you start getting tanks who try and pull tons of enemies. But again, it is doable. There will always be tanks who pull too much for their ability. There will always be tanks with too low a gear level. But a proper team you are ready to be doing big 10 plus enemy fights with is both rewarding and fun to heal. At least to me. I don't know, maybe you hate teamwork. Which, hating teamwork makes this topic a bit harder for you now. Because, while the tank isn't more important than any other person, everyone should follow their lead. The tank is the one responsible for pulling. You or the DPS pulling for them is rude at a minimum without an established agreement that they are allowed. So all you healers who keep pulling extra for the tank without asking, stop it. Maybe try communicating first and asking them to pull more because you can handle it instead of just doing it silently. More importantly though, than if they are not pulling enough for you to not be a jerk, is where they are. If they aren't running ahead, you should stay behind them. If they are running ahead, follow them. A very common thing I see new healers complain about is how the tank was running ahead. I can't heal through walls. They run too fast. Well, why are they able to get so far ahead? That's your fault, not theirs. If you were that far away to begin with, you were too far behind before they even took a single step. Your job isn't to stand as far away as you can while healing. Your job is to keep the group healed from anywhere within the map as required from moment to moment. If the moment requires you to be way far ahead of where you currently are, get moving. You have a button specifically for making you go faster. It's called Sprint. You can use this in dungeons. If the tank pop sprint, you pop sprint. It's really not any more difficult than that. Like, of course it would be proper protocol for the tank to wait for everyone to be caught up before sprinting away, but at that point, the tank is the only one doing as they should. That is because you and the DPS are lost puppies. You should be following the heels of the tank like your lives depended on it. Notice in basically all of my footage, go back if you have to, I'm standing very close or outright on top of the tank because of my AoE being melee based. You physically cannot use your magical AoEs because they're melee based attacks. And then Astrologen I'm there so that I don't fall behind. Now of course, this doesn't mean stand on top of the tank at all times. Avoidable AoEs are a thing, and bosses you should never be in front of, but you can always be close by. Right behind enemies is putting you close enough to be in range for any melee spell AoE without being in the danger zone of AoEs all going towards the tank. Even the general position of in melee range is a good place to be. You don't need to eat the leg of the boss, just be within range where an AoE heal would hit your DPS and the tank. But if you stay this close at all times, you never fall behind. The tank never runs out of range because you're almost always right by them. If you ever need to cast a spell before moving, you have a space and time because they aren't already rounding a corner without you. You rounded the corner with them. The tank running out of range is usually your fault. 
Did you not see what happened to the other healer who canonically let her tank get out of range? She's on a watch list now! Like, if nothing else, consider why a tank might round a corner. If you can't cast spells through walls, well, neither can the enemies. Magical and ranged enemies are common enough to need to deal with. If the tank rounds the corner to where the enemies can't hurt them, the ranged and mages have to round the corner as well. That's right! The move you thought was suicidal or was a mistake was an actual strategy to get enemies grouped up together so your DPS allies could properly hit them with AoE. And even you to hit them with your AoE. Sprint is a similar case. It's not just a make the dungeon a speedrun button. Sprint actually helps them pull better. Yes, it actually helps you pull as a tank. Standing with the tank also allows you to do strategies as well. You may have been told once or a thousand times to never use regen pre-pull. If you do, you will die or some guff like that. That is completely incorrect. For one, regen is an extremely useful tool for keeping the tank's health up while they are pulling. They're likely not going to start using defensive cooldowns until they've pulled every enemy they intend for the group to fight. But they will still take a little bit of damage along the way. Not a lot, but enough to matter. For two, you have a bunch of HP too. You can take a few hits before you die. Pop a regen on yourself as well, and you are safe. For three, the big reason why they warn you away from this is you make it harder for the tank to pull. Um, not if you're where you're supposed to be, chained to the hip like a good little lost puppy. From there, the enemies aren't going anywhere unexpected for the tank. They might move one foot or two in a different angle of direction, but not enough for the tank to wonder where they are off to. If the enemies do come after you, you'll take one or two small hits, and then that's it. Tank will have gotten enmity and started moving again. Which, speaking of enmity, there's this weird idea floating around that we avoid spamming heals because of enmity. No, enmity is a tank's game. The DPS are far sooner going to steal enmity than you spamming cures. We avoid spamming cures because healing an already full HP tank does nothing for the team. As we've already established plenty, I hope. But it really is as simple as that. Follow the tank, stand behind enemies and not literally on top of the tank when the fighting gets going. The end. I touched on this slightly a moment ago, but you should learn more about the other roles, and the other healers, than just what they are. Even a surface level learning of a role, and the individual jobs, can make you a more experienced healer. I touched on the idea of why a tank would round a corner or pop sprint. These are actual strategies tanks end up learning from osmosis or teaching because of how it makes their jobs easier or, in the case of Sprint, actually making your job as a healer easier. These are the kind of things you can learn by knowing the other roles or even specific jobs. The tanks especially would see immediate benefits for you to learn about. Each tank has the specific unique pieces that slightly change how you might need to heal them. Like, Warrior is arguably the weakest tank for most dungeoning, because their ultimate ability is the weakest for dungeons. But, later on they get an extremely powerful ability that essentially makes them their own healer for 6 seconds. That's quite the change, isn't it? It's all the way at level 76 as of this video, unfortunately, but going from potentially the worst dungeon tank to being their own healer is a huge leap in effectiveness for dungeons. Paladin, meanwhile, has the worst healing spell in the game because they constantly spam it when they have no reason to be, and actively make you effectively healing them harder. Yes, actually. We've already mentioned that speed of a fight can dictate survival, and clemency makes fights slower. It also often causes you to waste heals. Hey, if you're one of those people who thinks clemency is actually helping, for one, stop it. For two, go look at the scholar skill Excogitation, 
and get back to me on if your clemency helped or not. Save it for when you are actually out of cooldowns or in an emergency situation. Not literally the entire dungeon. Also, use your magic DPS, please. Mini rant aside, these are the differences you can learn by looking at or even playing other jobs. Knowing the intricacies of the tanks can help you know what to expect for a run's duration. Of course, this also assumes that tank knows their own job. But hey, beggars can't be choosers. And then there's also the other healers. While you yourself can get away with only playing one healer actively, you should know how the other healers work too, especially for the harder content. You might be able to mostly get away with hard trials and story raids not knowing how other healers work, but anything harder than that and you're in for a world of hurt. Let's get into a bit of why you want to know all healers and not just the one you were playing. It's all of the many, many, many 8 player instances and 24 mans which are 3 teams of 8. While most of them won't need you to know the other healers really well, you will be able to heal more effectively. What skills might this other healer use at this specific point of the fight? Which of your abilities synergize with those skills? And which, if any, will actually hurt your ally? For example, I mentioned the Scholar skill, Excogitation. If the targeted player falls below half health, they will automatically be healed. If the Scholar puts this on the tank for a tank buster, but you're trying to keep them at max HP the entire time, before, during, and after the tank buster, it will never go off until the timer runs out. And when the timer runs out, well who knows what health the tank will be at. They might already be at max health again. Now, usually skills aren't this specific in their use, but you see where I'm going here. Knowing how Scholar works, you can watch and plan for situations like that. Things that job excels in, you can count on, and you can shift your focus onto other aspects of a fight. Something bad happening might be something easily cleaned up by specifically only that job. This is also practice for higher level and harder content. The actual difficult content will test you, and both healers making proper use of their toolkits can make or break the healing difficulty of a fight. You can communicate, make suggestions of when to use specific skills, and turn a hard mechanic into a breeze for you two. Then there's the kind of things like knowing which healers are pure healers, white mage and astrologian, and which ones are shield based, scholar and sage. Shields can't stack, and knowing you don't have anyone with shields can very much change how you tackle a fight. There's no guaranteeing a player will act the way you expect even with communication, but you can try and steer them in the right direction with suggestions on how to use their toolkit. At that point though, you're no longer just a beginner. You've become more experienced and have made a leap forward in your time as a healer. More worrying would be the DPS who refuses to stay near the boss and make your life harder. You're more likely going to need to babysit people in these larger arenas, and where you will most likely get yelled at for something not your fault. You had a healer bubble down, they're just the bard who refused to stand in it. Finally, and potentially most importantly for things I want to specifically mention for larger scale content, is Healer LB3, Limit Break. Limit Break is normally a tool healers should entirely ignore. LB1 and LB2 are almost worthless as a healer, but LB3 is amazing. It is a full heal and raises everyone within range. It doesn't increase the damage penalty from raising either. If your group is half dead, four, five, or even six people on the ground, and you have LB3, run to the middle of the arena and hit that LB button. The ability does have a limited range, but from the direct center of an arena, it almost never will miss. And in Endwalker, they're increasing the range to 50 yalms which may even mean LB3 can hit the entirety of 24-man arenas, which, if you don't know, are huge, though they may still miss in some of those cases. Try and get the most people you can into LB range. But this alone can be the singular thing that saves runs, 
ultimately this goes back to that order of operations. You save yourself and let everyone else die if absolutely needed for the sole purpose of being able to heal at LB3 when the time arrives. Save people where you can, but you may never get the chance until you hear that ding of the gauge filling to three bars. Get this on your bars if it isn't already there. And now for some miscellaneous topics that might help you heal better. Some of these are more specific than something most newbies should do, or even specific to a control scheme. Others are just too small or not important enough for their own section. Firstly, edit your UI as much as you need to. Some people like to move their party list closer to the middle of the screen. Maybe make it larger. If you notice, my party list is much smaller. Maybe not the most optimal idea. Placing the enemy's cast bar in a good position to keep track of what attacks a boss is doing may also be useful. Additionally, focus targeting. In the targeting section of keybinds is the focus target keybind. Right click your target or use the keybind to focus target. On controller, it's square wall targeting. Then select focus target. In dungeons, focus target on your tank can be useful. And in eight person or larger fights, focus target the boss. This will give you a closer eye on important factors. Also, to target other alliances in 24 man raids, press L1 and hit left and right on the D-pad. Similar to UI and targeting is our skill Essena. When you see a debuff on an ally, if it has a white line above it, you can use Essena to remove the debuff. Please do remove debuffs when they need to be removed. It can be anything as non-threatening as a very, very, very light poison that won't even do 10% of the health, to instant death. Which also you should learn your job and every skill you have if it wasn't obvious. Read your tooltips. They explain what a skill does pretty well, but there's some bad tooltips in the game. But they're a rarity, not the norm. Please read. And maybe watch my leveling guides. Something to make sure you understand your skills at least. When you get into a dungeon, examine your tank and their gear. In the same window focus target is in, is examine. This is where you can see their gear. If their gear sucks, you may need to heal more. If they're wearing top of the line raid gear, you'll have a generally easier time. When a boss is dead, don't bother raising people. Every time you kill a boss, a shortcut turns on. From the start of the dungeon, or any other duty really, you can teleport straight to the boss you just beat. Raising does have a penalty of 25% lower stats that can stack twice to 50% lower stats. This is a huge amount of power. Just make them raise themselves and teleport back to the boss. And we earlier talked about not panicking when everything goes wrong. Don't have fear in general. Being afraid is going to distract you from otherwise obvious and easy to see things. Save your fear for the harder content that deserves it. And by then, you probably won't fear it because you're more experienced and realize something isn't so bad now. As long as you have good gear at least. Which, have good gear. That one should be obvious, but I'm going to state it anyway just in case. That rounds out the miscellaneous tips, but let's move right into the finale. Of course, A, B, C. Always be casting. You may have come into this guide not understanding what A, B, C actually means. Always be casting. The explanation for A, B, C is A, B, C. That really all there is to it. What it says is exactly what it means. Always be casting. This is the most important tip that will take the most practice to get right. Anytime you could be casting a spell, you should be casting a spell. This can be a heal when needed, or a DPS spell. Unless you're almost at zero mana at least. Maybe don't be ABCing when you have no mana. A major part of this is learning where to position yourself for boss fights. Some bosses would appreciate you moving somewhere else without putting your party in danger. 
The rest of the time, it's about minimizing movement and making use of your instant cast abilities. Anytime you have to put your dot on an enemy, use this time to move. Use swift cast to move as needed and maintain casting up time. Just remember you no longer have it around for raising. And also get learning on slide casting, which will benefit all casters and not just healers. Slide casting is abusing the fact that this is an MMO. Due to latency, there is a delay between when the game sees you moving locally and the servers understanding you are moving. If you have 200 ping, that's 0.2 seconds of latency. So if you try to move when there is less than 0.2 seconds left in a cast, the cast will still complete. This is what slide casting is. The actual numbers don't matter, and there's no in-game way to check ping, but there's also some built-in slide casting tolerance, and the window for slide casting widens the worse ping you have. But even if you have amazing internet, little to no ping because you live near the servers, slide casting can increase how much casting you can fit in within a fight. In more complex or harder fights, this isn't one or two more casts. It can be done dozens of casts more, and if any of those can be a heal, it could even save the day. Healing when you need to be moving and people are about to die. Your special cast speed skills aren't the only way to achieve this. You may have also noticed in watching other people play, they do something like this, where they mash the keys a lot. This isn't just to look cool or be fancy, they're trying to ABC. You don't need to massively mash the buttons like this, but just learn the lesson of why they are doing it. It's called ability queuing. Much like slide casting lets you finish casting, ability queuing lets you cast sooner. The game will still recognize skill inputs, even when you can't be using another skill yet. The window is relatively small, only maybe about half a second, but if you press a GCD half a second before your character is able to execute it, they will execute it immediately upon your GCD rolling to zero. Again, maybe not recommended to mash the keys like this, but do maybe try to hit it once or twice as the GCD is rolling over to try and make the skill go off sooner. This too adds up extremely fast. And there's always a few other small things here and there you can learn to ABC, like weaving your off-global abilities between global cooldowns. Properly learning to time these will also increase how much casting you are able to do. As I said, this is something you will be learning for your entire career as a player of the game. Keep pressing buttons, but reasonably so so you don't kill your hands. But if you want to be improving as a player, ABC is the most important thing to learn and practice every chance you get. There's learning how to play a healer, then there's mastery of something that applies to every job in the game. Thank you for watching ABC, A Beginner's Guide to Healer. As I said, this went over a lot of different topics that may or may not be evolutions on previous topics, and something you will learn as you go. Don't try and force knowing everything at once. Learn a little bit at a time. Push yourself a little further every dungeon. Eventually, you'll be doing amazingly. Feel free to leave feedback or further advice for newbie healers to know as they train themselves, or even ask questions on something you didn't understand within the video. This is here to help after all. Be sure to check the description for any added information as well. Maybe Endwalker changes more than we expect or such. Perhaps at one point, I will also create a video on intermediate level healing. Keep an eye out for that, but the future holds many possibilities. But otherwise, take care, and may the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And this was a monster to complete. So I'd like to give an extra special thanks to all my patrons on Patreon, and an extra extra special thanks to Amen Alktib, Benjamin Han, Body Clock, Dmitry Shibanov, tell me if I got that one right, Ethan, Ethan Olson, James, Kevin Lowe, 
Kyle Steinhauser, Rizella, Scott Stanley, and Valor LLC. Links down below for my Twitter, my Discord, all that good stuff. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.